So here I am on a beautiful sunny day in New Zealand and recently I was in Antarctica for six weeks with a science team. So I was embedded with this science team, I was allowed to explore and I learned all about the science but also about life in Antarctica and the whole environment. So here are the 10 highlights I experienced of my time in Antarctica. Highlight number one, the flight south. So we flew down to the ice from Christchurch, New Zealand and it's an impressive experience flying in a huge military plane but above all the views looking down to the unfolding icy wilderness of Antarctica are mesmerizing. The landscape down there is totally devoid of human structures or roads or houses. You can see no sign of life, a truly empty wilderness. There are mountain ranges, glaciers, frozen ocean and eventually Ross Island as we neared our landing field on the McMurdo ice shelf. Arriving on the ice shelf landing field feels like the threshold of a very different world. Highlight number two, Scott Base. Scott Base is a small outpost on the edge of Ross Island. It is the New Zealand base and it can cater for a maximum of about 90 people at a time. It's a staging point for many science expeditions that go from there deeper into the Antarctic landscape. So once they're organised they fly or drive out to their field sites either on Ross Island or on the ice shelf somewhere or in the Transantarctic Mountains. Scott Base is an experience all of its own. You're looked after by a dedicated, high-functioning group of people who look after the infrastructure, the machinery, the food, the domestic services, the field equipment and your safety while down on the ice. Whilst at the base you can venture out for various walks, you can go mountain biking and cross-country skiing or you can visit the much larger US McMurdo station which is just about three kilometers away. Highlight number three, the team. So science expeditions to Antarctica are very few due to the cost and logistics of traveling there and undertaking field work in such a remote and difficult environment. So science teams are usually very small groups of people each with different skills or research specializations. You're bunched together in a close-knit group for weeks at a time and so you get to know each other's strengths and weaknesses quickly and intensely. There is a strong sense of shared privilege and awe at being able to participate in such a life-changing experience even from people who've been there many times before. Highlight number four, the camp. The personal gear and the camp equipment is super rugged as you would expect as it has to keep you warm in extreme low temperatures and high winds. So apart from being tough for wear and tear, the principle of layering is key. So with your clothing, you add or take away layers to adjust to the fluctuations of temperature through the day. Because the equipment is so good, you can easily overheat when at work. But also you can get cold really quickly. For example, if you have to take your gloves off to do a fiddly task, or if some of your face is exposed when you're traveling on a skidoo. Highlight number five, the science research. Our research project was led by Andrew Martin of Victoria University of Wellington, Te Herenga Waka. We were investigating the microbiology of rhodopsin proteins that form part of the cell membranes in sea ice bacteria. These proteins have the ability to use energy from sunlight in a way that is quite new to science and part of our research was to alter the light conditions in the sea ice to find out how these rhodopsin bearing bacteria adapted to the different light wavelengths. We were also camped near to two other science teams. One of them was using a special drill to extract the very delicate platelet ice crystals from the base of the sea ice without damaging their fragile physical structure. The other project was using drones to image the thermal properties and reflectivity or albedo of snow on the sea ice. It also included close-up studies of the snow that had built up on the surface of the sea ice. 
Highlight number six, sea ice. Up to 18 million square kilometers of the ocean around Antarctica freezes and then melts every year. This sea ice develops to about one or two meters thick. It is actually quite variable and not all of it melts so that some of it is multi-year ice. The process of sea ice formation goes through several stages, starting as tiny separate crystals which increase in size and quantity. They eventually form pancake ice, lots of separate disks that jostle together and gradually dampen down the waves. Eventually they all join up and a flat, uniform sheet of sea ice develops. The weather conditions such as air and ocean temperature, the wind and ocean currents all affect the rate of ice formation. Another thing to note is that as seawater freezes, it squeezes out the salt, which becomes concentrated brine at the base of the sea ice, as well as in channels trapped within it. Platelet ice sometimes accumulates on the bottom of the sea ice. It is made of lots of very thin crystals that float up against the sea ice to make a complex mesh of crystals. Highlight number seven, the wildlife. There is not much wildlife at all in the depths of Antarctica, but here in the coastal regions such as at McMurdo Sound, there are seals, penguins and skewers, which are a type of scavenging seabird, and these survive on the marine food chain, starting with the microbial life and then small fish in the sea ice and water. Around Scott Base, the Weddell seals are the most obvious large animals, and they are easily seen and photographed just outside the base. Penguin colonies occur a bit of a distance away, and occasional travelling penguins turn up near to the base too. Highlight number eight, the geology. Scott Base is on a peninsula on Ross Island. So Ross Island is part of a complex of peaks around Mount Erebus, the world's southernmost active volcano. It is separated from the mainland of Antarctica and the Transantarctic Mountains by McMurdo Sound. Scott Base is built on a lava flow that erupted from nearby Crater Hill a few hundred thousand years ago. Apart from the volcanic landforms and rocks, there are interesting craters and glacial features in the area. Highlight number nine, the history. The Discovery Hut beside McMurdo Station was the starting point for Captain Scott's first attempt on the South Pole in 1902 to 1903. He was accompanied by Shackleton and after this expedition there were never friends again. There are two more huts from that heroic era of exploration at Cape Evans and Cape Royds. So the area is steeped in epic Antarctic history, and these huts are some of the most atmospheric places you can imagine. They still contain equipment from when they were last lived in, including tools, clothes, seal blubber and food, well over a hundred years old. I had the good fortune to be guided through the Discovery Hut by Lizzie Meek, who works for the Antarctic Heritage Trust and spends a lot of time in Antarctica helping to conserve the many artefacts in the huts. Highlight number 10, the spellbinding 24-7 views. One of the deepest impressions I'm left with after my visit to Antarctica is the incredible views across vast spaces to far distant mountains. The light is ever-changing as the sun rotates around the sky for 24 hours a day. The air is sometimes so clear that you can completely misjudge the distances. The sense of space, the light and emptiness keeps pulling your eyes up to the distant horizon even when you're up at two in the morning. Strangely, although there is so much snow and ice and you might think it would be monotonous, this is not the case. The views remain compelling as the light keeps changing and they never lose their fascination. So there you have it, 10 highlights from a trip to Antarctica. Is Antarctica a place that you'd love to go to? If so, what do you think would be your top favourite thing to do with your time down on the ice? <laughs>